Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you're safe and well. Welcome to our webinar, The Truth, Coronavirus or COVID-19 and Dubai Real Estate. Um, so before we get started, I would like to um, actually ask for the next slide, please, Said, and then I'll go over the webinar content so that you know what you're going to gain from this webinar. I'll start by giving a quick introduction to each of the panelists. We've got Mohammed Nahal, Senior Sales Manager. Um, Mohammed has been at ISPAS since day one for 11 years. We've got Gil Van Gelder, also a Senior Sales Manager. Gil manages one of our sales teams, as Mohammed does. Uh, last year, Gil was independently recognized and awarded as the second best broker in Dubai by the Property Founder Group, which is obviously a massive achievement out of 4,000 brokers. So we're grateful to have Gil on the panel. We've got Mark Richards. Mark is the head of sales and, uh, sorry, head of leasing and property management. And Mark has been active in the Dubai real estate market for 15 years. Mark bought his first property in Dubai in 2005. Moving on to myself, I'm John Lyons and I'm the managing director of ASPAS. I've been in Dubai and at ASPAS for eight years. And prior to moving to Dubai, I worked in commercial property management and commercial investment brokering. So what we're going to do today on this webinar is we're going to go through the points there that you can see. I'll give a quick introduction about ASPAS. Many of you will know ASPAS. Many of you will already have done business with ASPAS. Um, but for those who are not so familiar, I'll give you a quick overview because I think it's important that you understand who it is that you are hearing from today. Then we'll move on to a sales market overview. Then I will hand over to Mark, who will give an overview of the leasing market. Um, then we'll move forward to Mohammed and Gil, who have identified five of the best properties right now. Although the market is difficult, there are still properties transacting and Gil and uh, Mohammed have identified the, what they consider to be the best five out of all the properties currently available for sale at SPAS. And then we'll move on to a Q&A. And at the end, I'll just give a few closing statements. Now, the objective of our webinar um, is to deliver transparency. This is what we're aiming to do with this, this event. We want to provide you with a transparent and useful overview of the real estate market and we think it is particularly important to do so during the coronavirus crisis because there is a lot of uncertainty around. We know that the real estate industry has a challenged reputation. We have always prided ourselves on differentiating ourselves from that reputation. And I genuinely believe that the most liquid and efficient marketplaces achieve their success by offering full transparency to the consumers. So, with that in mind, we look at ourselves. We're a large brokerage. We consider ourselves to be a marketplace. When clients want to transact, they know that they can call us up, we'll work hard, we'll make the necessary connections and we'll close out those transactions for our clients. So having given recognition to the fact that Espas Real Estate is a marketplace, the logical path for us to follow is one of total transparency. And that's obviously, what we intend to do with um, with this webinar. So if I could ask for the next slide, please, I'll just give you a brief intro about Espace Real Estate. Okay, Espace Real Estate was founded in 2009. We're a company of 95 staff with over 60 brokers. We've sold over 10 billion dirhams worth of Dubai real estate over an 11 year period. Transaction, we transact at all levels of the market from properties under 1 million dirhams up to our largest transaction at 100 million dirhams. That transaction was actually done by Mohammed, who's on the panel. Um, predominantly, we're a secondary market sales, leasing, and property management brokerage, but we do operate in the off plan market as well. Um, but having said that, although we've had notable success in the off-plan market. The core of the business is secondary market, and we think that that makes us a good bellwether for what is actually happening in the secondary market in Dubai. We have significant market share in many of Dubai's most well-established freehold communities. So communities that you will all have heard and will know well, Meadows, Springs, Arabian Ranches, the Lakes, Jumeirah Islands, uh, Dubai Marina, Pam Jumeirah, all of these communities, these secondary market communities, that's where 
Espast has na made a name for itself. So that's who we are. And now I'd like to go into the detail about what is actually happening. If we have the next slide, please, I'll go through what is actually happening in the Dubai real estate market um, and what has happened as we approach this crisis. Before we get into the, the nitty gritty of the impact of coronavirus in the last few weeks, I'll give you a bit of market context. So, in, and this is important because when you look at the next slides, you'll realize that it's important that we provide you with this context. In Q1 last year, it was a difficult time. For Espas, transaction volume was not disastrously low, but it was certainly very challenging, and there, there's no getting away from that. But, and I'd say that even lasted until April last year. By May, we were a bit downbeat if we were to be truthful with ourselves, but that's really when things started to turn a corner. And we noticed that over the 11, sorry, the eight month period from May to December, that things really started to turn a corner for us. We started to see transaction volume increase and we had growth of 10% on a year on year basis during that period. We entered 2020 with the same positive sentiment, that positive sentiment that was felt in our office with our brokers and also with buyers, with end users who finally thought and think that it was the right time to come into this market on the back of what has been a six year decline in pricing. So we started this year very strongly. Q1 2020 is 29% higher in transaction volume compared to the same period last year. So the good news is that we are entering this, let's call it a crisis, um, in a very good position. We are entering it with what were good fundamentals there was strong demand in the market and we certainly as a business were were, were finding that that was a, a positive news story to tell if we could go to the next slide please we'll show you on this next slide the unfortunate reality of the shutdown with coronavirus and we want to be very honest and upfront with you about what is actually happening and we want to share real data with you that is from as fast real estate what we've got here is the data from our sales department from Property Finder, the biggest portal in the Middle East. This is our number one source of buyer inquiries, and it's where we do the majority of our business from Property Finder. The top left graph that you can see is impressions, and impressions basically represent traffic. That's the number of times people actually see our content. And as you can see, the blue line is 2020 and the red line is 2019. This is a 10 week graph. So each section represents one week and we're looking at week on week comparison for the last 10 weeks. We started 10 weeks ago with very high search volume on our sales listings, way higher than last year. And as I mentioned, last year was a slightly challenging period. So we started with very high traffic. Of course, when we've come into the uncertainty of a lockdown, what we would expect to happen has happened. The traffic has fallen dramatically, and you can see that blue line falls pretty uh, in a pretty steep decline. But the glimmer of hope is that it slightly rebounds off the bottom and it doesn't continue to go down any further. Now, obviously, it's still early days, so we will need to wait and see where this graph goes from here. But traffic volume now, although it has fallen dramatically, it is still, as you can see, around the same level as we were experiencing this time last year. So it's not disastrously, disastrously low. If we move to the next graph on the top right, listing clicks, the number of people that are actually clicking in to see our content, to see our sales listings. Again, we started with high weekly volume and it has fallen. You can see it's fallen. But again, it's roughly in the same line as the as the red line now, and it hasn't come down any lower in recent weeks. In the last 10 days, it seems to be stabilizing, which we take um, as a positive sign, although we do recognize there are some tough times ahead, so we won't try and read too much into that at this stage. But you can see that there's a dramatic fall uh, in the listing clicks. And the graph there leads. Our sales leads have fallen, again, as you would expect, dramatically. But again, I'll point out the slight bottoming out there of the leads. In the last week, we have noticed that some 
buyers have started to re-engage with us and investors and end users are starting to get on the phone again and ask us questions about what is happening with the market. There definitely appears to be an interest to engage with us to find to ask questions. Um, we will have to wait and see whether that results in transactions. Time will tell. If we could move to the next slide, I will show you some more data that is specifically from Espas Real Estate. It's our CRM data, and it's very important metrics that we look at new buyer registrations, top left graph there. Um, again, it's fallen, same story, but it's not dramatically lower than this time last year. It's roughly the same. Um, weekly price reductions. The blue line there, where you see it, where you see it um, peak out, again, that's the number, there's more price reductions from the sellers who are actively on the market in the last, let's say two weeks ago, but then the number fell. So there, there are sellers who want to exit this market and they recognize that they've got to get ahead of the curve and they've got to price a little bit more aggressively. And that's why you see that blue line peak about two weeks ago. But it didn't peak outside of the range. It's still at a level that we would, that we would conclude that there isn't any distress amongst the sellers who are actively on the market with SPAS at the moment. And actually, you can see that the number of price reductions then falls quite dramatically in the last, uh, you know, in that, that same sort of period. And that is basically sellers saying to us, we are also going to wait and see. Maybe buyers are waiting and seeing, but sellers, we're also going to wait and see. And, and we're not really desperate to sell during this crisis. We think that maybe we'll have to sell at a lower price um, at this moment in time. So we'll wait until all of this passes and then we'll, we'll see where we go. New listings. The blue line shows that actually the listings have come down. So again, it shows that there's no real distress in the market because if there was, we would see a wave of new listings, a wave of new instructions, and that hasn't been the case. In fact, there seems to be that wait and see approach with the sellers as well as there is with the buyers. And that means that we feel that that helps to put a bit of a floor on where this market might go because if you're going to see dramatic declines in pricing, you need to see a little bit of panic and a little bit of distress in the market. And we haven't seen that yet. And um, that definitely gives us a bit of encouragement that although transaction volume might be low for a period of time, there isn't that rush to the exit the way there maybe is if, or there is during times of uh, markets being more leveraged. For example, in 2008, the market was highly leveraged. And when the economic shock arrived, everybody ran for the exit at the same time and you saw huge declines. At this moment in time, prices have already fallen for six years. So they're already at levels that are considered very low over the last five, six, six year period. And that's where I feel that there's not the same rush to the exit the way there might have been if, if it was a more leveraged market. So it's still early days. We are trying to be very realistic and we are sharing the data with you to show you the real change that is happening in the market right now but we're, we're trying to be positively realistic. That's the way that we're trying to look at this. And it, the honest answer is nobody knows where it will go. It's still early days and we will have to wait and see how things pan out in the weeks and months ahead. If I could move to the next slide, please. Looking at the China comparison, I think it's, I think it's useful to look at China uh, because obviously they are ahead of us in their pandemic. And we can maybe see if there's any trends that occurred in China that we can, we can apply to our market here in Dubai. China peaked in the pandemic on the 17th of February. And one month later, China recorded no cases. Now, since then, there has been a slight increase. There's been some cases. We hope there's not a resurgence in China, but obviously it looks like they're doing everything they can to try and keep borders tight and not let cases re-emerge. But the more interesting thing here is to see the pandemic graph and how it is completely inversely correlated to the, to the graph, the next graph on the right there, which shows the property sales in 30 major cities in, in China. And as you can see, there's a dramatic fall at the end of January. That fall is not actually because of coronavirus. That fall is because of Chinese New Year. And that happens every year. The difference this year is that the graph didn't rebound. It then bumped along the bottom during their lockdown. 
And that is the period that we are in right now. So we are at the moment, to some extent, bumping along the bottom with very little activity. But the encouraging thing that we can take from this graph is that, as you can see, about 6,000 transactions took place by the 31st of March. The graph is not a straight line recovery, but it's certainly come a long way from the bottom. And they're now back to the range that they were before they went into this um, event, which is great, which is great news. Um, so I think uh, we can take a lot of a lot of comfort from that. Um, if we could move to the next slide, please. So I'm going to finish up this section before I hand over to Mark, just by bringing some comments from Ben Bernanke, the former Federal Reserve Chairman who served before and after the 2008 financial crisis. The reason I want to bring some of his comments to the forefront of the discussion is because there's a lot of there's a lot of noise out there. There's a lot of extreme views. There's a lot of people suggesting that this could be, you know, greater than the, the, the depression of the 1930s. And I like, instead of listening to absolutely every comment out there, I like to look at the cool heads, the people who have been there and seen it before. He's a scholar of the of that 1930s depression, and he's obviously um, he was the Federal Reserve Chairman uh, for the biggest. Uh, central bank in the world. He says, this is a very different animal than the Great Depression. So he's debunking those views that this is going to somehow be the same. The Great Depression, for one thing, lasted for 12 years, and it came from human problems, monetary and financial shocks that hit the system. He goes on to say, this has some of the same feel of panic, some of the same uh, volatility. But he says, it's really much closer to a major snowstorm or a natural disaster than it is to a classic 1930s style depression. Now, what I take from that is the fact that this is not some systemic problem with capitalism, the way the financial crisis of 08 was, and the way the Great Depression was in, the, in 1929 and the 30s. Um, this is, as he points out, something that is closer to what was maybe experienced in Japan during the tsunami, or in New Orleans during the storm surge, or any other natural disaster where you see that economies actually bounce back quite quickly because there isn't a fundamental uh, systemic problem with capitalism. Um, and that doesn't have to be sorted out. If it did, that would take a lot of time to flow through the system. So I am hopeful that he is right. Um, obviously, nobody knows because this is such an unprecedented event. Nobody ultimately knows. So we have to keep an open mind, and I certainly am. But I will be cautiously optimistic but I'll be realistic at the same time. I am perfectly aware of the fact that there are some tough, uh, there's a tough road ahead. Um, so I'll now pass over to Mark Richards, and Mark will give an overview of the leasing market. Fantastic, thanks, John. Hi, everybody, and uh, thanks again for joining us all today. Um, hope everyone's staying safe at home. Um, so if uh, Sadie, if you can move over to my first slide, please. First of all, I'll just mention that um, thank you for all the questions. We had um, an unbelievable amount of questions. I think we were near 200 questions that came um, offline before we uh, before we started the webinar from uh, people who've registered, which we'll go through in the Q&A. Um, we'd also like to invite people to ask questions live as well. So if you are online and you want to ask us something that is um, a conversation that we've had or information that we've shared that sparked some kind of question for you, then um, we'd like to share that. Uh, like to share that as well. Um, I've been communicating with a few people on here while you've been asking questions um, back and forward, and um, we'll share that with the panel as well later on. So if you can send those through, um, then we will answer as many as we can. I think something that we had discussed as well is the fact that because so many questions have come through, that um, we will probably do either a follow-up webinar or some additional videos just to answer some of the questions in a bit more detail. Obviously, uh, we're not going to keep everyone here for four or five hours till we answer uh, hundreds of questions. So, um, moving on. Um, so, obviously, I'm head of leasing, so I'm going to give you an update on what's been happening in uh, the leasing market. I'll do a little bit on the statistics and what's happened, similar to John's overview in sales, um, since we've had the uh, seen the impact of the coronavirus. Uh, pandemic, and then I'll move on to a little bit about SPAS and how we've um, delivered results this year and what that looks like. So if you can move on to the first slide for me, please, Saeed. 
Okay, so the first thing we're looking at here, and again, um, this is data from uh, Property Finder. So we are um, seeing in the first week of February um, quite a, a steady number of uh, impressions. And as, as mentioned earlier, impressions are basically how many times um, a listing has been seen. So for example, if you were on a, on a property portal and you made a search um, for a one bedroom apartment in Dubai Marina, however many properties come up in that search, they would be classed as an impression when somebody scrolls down and shows those properties. So you can see um, there's been a gradual decline um, certainly not what I would class as falling off a cliff, but there has been quite a, a serious decline um, over that period of time. Um, somewhere in the region of 35 to 40% is the decline that we've seen um, from the sort of peak to the trough of that. What you'll notice then is moving over to the leasing clicks, which is basically somebody has done the search, they've then seen a property that they want to get more information on, and they actually click on that listing you can see that the correlation is almost identical between the two. And what that tells me is that this is the number of people out searching actively in the market. Now, what I noticed then was looking at the bottom graph, which is the leasing leads. This is the number of people that have then actually made an inquiry with us at Espas, and they have chose to move forward and suggest that they would like to get either more information or a range of viewing, but they have then connected with Espas um, on, a, on a different level to just searching online. And what you'll notice there is that we've actually seen um, much bigger jumps and much bigger um, drops in our lead generation, which for me shows a couple of things. I think what it shows is, first of all, when we look at the impressions, that's the people that are actively online searching. Of course, you're always going to have a certain amount. We've got a lot of investors, we've got a lot of buyers, a lot of tenants. Um, on the webinar now and a lot of those people will of course have a constant interest in the markets there's obviously going to be people out there searching there's always going to be people as well that are maybe looking in two or three months from now that are wanting to get a bit of insight on what if they're um, you know if they're expecting a, a second child or their first child and their family's expanding they might be looking at options of where they can move in different communities um, and it could also be people that are considering moving to Dubai but when we look at the actual leads that generate the leads that are generated, this is people taking a real active um, move forward to inquire with us and potentially start viewing. So what I can see there is you can see on um, the week uh, 16th to the 22nd of February, you can see there's quite a big spike in inquiries. But what's more interesting for me to see is if we look around the 22nd to the 28th of March, then you can see there's a way bigger decline in the leads generated than there was in the listing in, uh, in the leasing impressions and the listing clicks what that tells me is this is all around the time of the lockdown in dubai and when things started to get a little bit more serious um, i think we have obviously in different countries we've seen a different flow of how things have started to affect the countries and obviously there's a lot of different reasons for that we have um a huge amount of traffic in terms of tourism coming through um, through Dubai. So obviously that has quite a big effect. And of course now Emirates Airlines and the airlines and the airports have been pretty much on full lockdown uh, for quite some time. So what we've seen there against a 35 to 40 percent drop in listing impressions and clicks, we've actually seen nearly a 60 percent drop in terms of leads that have been generated. Now, that just tells me that for that period, of course, the first week that everyone went into lockdown, there was a huge amount of changes. Certainly, the way we started operating was wildly different to, um, to the way we've been operating in the business for many years. Um, a lot of people move into online meetings and webinars as we're doing today. So I think that has created the first initial, initial shock. Then what we've seen is actually a, a quite a nice bounce back in terms of lead generation and then uh, another fall again. So as there's positivity moving through the market of when we think we might be able to go out and view again, um, then this is changing. What I do see from all of this coming to a bit of a conclusion is that I see that there's a bit of a sort of tidal wave coming in leads that are gonna be generated, mainly on the basis that the lead generation fell um, a lot more aggressively than the, than the impressions and the people out there searching. Um, so my take from this at the moment is that, um, and these are only my 
um, sort of ideas and thoughts on the data that's provided to me. But I would assume that when the lockdown is um, taken away and we are able to move a bit more freely, that certainly we'll notice that there's a big up, um, an upward curve in terms of leads that are generated. Um, and I would say more aggressively than the, uh, than the impressions and the clicks that, that are coming through. Um, so that's a little bit of information. Um, again, if you do have any questions, um, then please uh, pass those across and we'll answer those at the end. Um, I'll talk a little bit about um, Aspas Real Estate as well and what we've done in the, in the leasing department. Um, I joined Aspas Real Estate about 12 months ago and, and the reason I was brought on was to um, look at ways that we could increase the, um, the business that's generated, look at strengthening the team and look at different ways to um, tackle the market. And what we've done certainly in that period of time, if I take out transactions that we've generated um, so far in Q1 of 2020 versus 2019, we've already seen an increase of just over, um, sorry, just under 20%, 19.83% in terms of um, transactions that we've put through the business um, and people that have rented properties through us. Um, we've also seen, which absolutely um, books the trend that is in the market at the moment. Obviously, as John mentioned, prices have been falling for um, many years now, um, as anyone in Dubai is fully aware. But what we've seen is an actual increase of the average rental value of 10.9%. Now, obviously, that doesn't um, flow with the market sentiment, um, but that is more internally on how we've um, tackled the market and how we've moved our business forward over the last 12 months. Um, obviously, an increase in rental transactions, an increase in rental value um, has had a positive effect on our department, giving us uh, an, in an increase in revenue of around 31%. I think the reason I want to make that point um, is that obviously we've, we've strengthened the team in, in many ways, but it means that just because the general market spread um, shows a downward trend in certain things, whether that's leads, whether that's listings, whether that's um, transactions done, it doesn't necessarily mean that every segment and every indi individual business is being affected in the same way. Um, so that's pretty much it from uh, from me, guys. So I'm going to hand over now to um, Gil Van Gelder and Mohamed Nahal, who are going to go through the next section of the webinar. Um, if anyone, uh, like I said, does have any questions, please feel free to push those across and we'll answer those um, where we can. So thank you very much, guys. Hope that's been of some interest to you. And I'll now hand over to Gil van Gelder. Thank you, Mark. And welcome to the property section of the webinar. We selected five properties out of 1,000 that we think are the best options available on the market at the moment. Let's have a look at property number one. Next slide, please. This property is located in Emirates Living Lakes. Next slide, please, say it. Yeah, so next slide, one before, please. Sorry about that, guys. Here we go. Property number one. This property is located in Emirates Living Lakes. It's a C middle type, which is a three bedroom, study on the first floor, and a separate maids room. The asking price for this property is 2.35 million dirhams, and we are encouraging offers from 1.95 million. So, to put things in perspective for you, the last C middle sold a few houses down from this one, sold in January 2020 for 2.25 million dirhams. At the suggested closing price, this is a 15% decrease in pricing. For another comparable, in Feb 2020, we sold a smallest three bedroom townhouse, a type D middle, which is a three bedroom with no maids room, at 2 million and 75. So to close this C middle at 1.95 million, as suggested, this is an 8.5 decrease in pricing for a bigger property. Here are some more pictures of the property. Now, the unique situation of this property is it's highly mortgaged. Both seller and this pass have managed to negotiate with the bank a closing price below what is owed to the bank. So it's put it 
perfectly for an end user to buy their next family home or for an investor to come in and achieve a 7.8% gross rental yield based on 150,000 rental yearly. As you can see, it's got a nice open plan, living dining room area, open kitchen, nice garden, and the pool and park is literally just a stone throw away. Uh, next slide, please. And we'll have a look at property number two. Now, this one's one of the bigger ones. This property is located in Arabian Ranches, another EMAR community, one of the biggest EMAR communities. It has over 6,000 villas, if I'm not mistaken. This villa is a Hattan Luxury One Edition, so an L1. Uh, it's located within the Hattan community in the Arabian Ranches, and it's one of 92 Hattans available. The asking price for this property is 5.5 million dirhams, just under 5.5 million dirhams. And we are encouraging offers from 5 million. The property has been extended. It offers a built-up area of 7,100 square foot, seven bedrooms, three-story villa with a roof terrace, and it sits on a huge corner plot of 13,000 square foot. Now, the last property, L1, that transacted, sold for 5.4 million dirhams, and it didn't have the big plot or the extensions. It was just a standard plot, standard property. At the suggested price, this is a 7.5 decrease from the last one sold, similar type. Similar to the first property mentioned, this is also a highly leveraged property with the bank, and they're willing to work with us and the buyer and underwrite a fraction of the liability. Next slide, we'll show you a few more pictures of the property. So nice back-to-back -back location, open plan. The walls have been removed between the living room and the dining room area. A huge 13,000 square foot plot, very private, nice heated and chilled swimming pool, as you can see. So a great property for anyone that's looking for a, a bigger house for this kind of dimensions. So for the next few properties, I'll pass it on to my colleague, Mohammed. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Gil, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I wanna mention three, the other three hot properties that we've chosen for you, uh, specifically for this webinar. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, I want to start with this property in the lakes. It's a DEMA, it's a type five. Type five is the biggest three bedroom available in Emirates Living. It's a community. That's why is it's supposed to be one of the hot properties. Now, price-wise, this house has been reduced from 3.5 million to 3.2 million. And the owner is willing to look at offers from 3 million. At 3 million plus, this will make it the cheapest three beds that has been sold in the last five years in Emirates Living. Um, I'll show you some internal photos, please, Sayed. So, this house is very well kept, very well maintained. It has a very mature garden, very close to the communal park and pool. And no need to say the lakes is one of the best communities in Dubai. Next property, please. So the next property will be in Victory Heights. It's a gallery villa. It's a three bed townhouse in one of the great communities. It's within Sports City, Victory Heights. It's a middle unit. It's a three bedrooms townhouse, 2,450 square feet, very well sized. Um, it has a pool. And the most interesting thing about this property is that you can use all the amenities in Victory Heights, the communal pool, parks, uh, jogging tracks, everything. So um, price-wise, this is one of the best that have been seen for the last four or five years. Now, 
The asking price of this one is 1,650,000. The last one that got sold a month back was 1,750,000 and it didn't have a pool. This one, the seller is willing to take offers from 1.4 million. This will make it great for an end user and an investor. The service fees is very low. It's just under 10,000 per uh, 10,000 dirhams per year. So it's Mediterranean style, great community, very well maintained house and well sized townhouse. Uh, I'll show you some internal photos, please. Sayed. Next one. So these are the internal photos. This is the pool, uh, the garden, um, and it's not an old community as well. It's probably aged less than five years at the moment. So that's making a very good investment. And even for end users, it's a very nice family home. We'll go to the last property that we have for today. Next one, please. Okay, this one is a one bed apartment in Dubai Hills in Acacia Park Heights. So this one is a brand new, never lived in. We've done the snagging last week and it's due to hand over any time. What's special about this property? Now, the original price of this house was just under 1.4 million. Now the asking price is below 1 million. It's listed at 950. Now, 950, the, it's, it's cheaper than the smaller units that are available in the market. This one has around 937 square feet. The other ones, the other one bedrooms in the same buildings are around 600 square feet, 700. This is cheaper than the smaller units. So it's a great investment and there is a slightly room for negotiation on the price. And it's a brand new, and Amar community, Dubai Hills, it's all plus points. Um, we'll show you some internal photos, please. So these are fully fitted kitchen. It has a balcony. It's the highest floor within the building. It's a G plus nine building. This is on the ninth floor. As you know, Amar will have a lot of amenities within the building from pool, gym, access to parks. Dubai Hills is the newest community in Dubai and location wise, it's very close to almost everything. So uh, these are the five properties. As you can see, we've chosen different types of properties, apartments, uh, independent property, in the independent villas, townhouses, and we chose the range from just under 1 million up to 5.5. So this will have a range for you, for any investor to pick up the property that he likes within, uh, within the budget. So uh, I'll go back to John, if he would like to mention some, uh, answer some uh, question, some answers of the questions asked. Thank you very yeah. much. Thank you, gents. Uh, thank you, Mark. Thank you, Gil. Thank you, Mohammed. Very informative. I uh, hope everyone that's uh, watching this found that useful. Um, we're going to now move on to some questions um, and some very interesting questions coming through. So I'll, I'll dish them out. The first question is from a, a tall, jovial chap who works in the real estate market. Uh, he asks me, he says, John, specifically, how much wood could a woodchuck chuck if a woodchuck could chuck wood? Andrew, the honest answer is I don't know. But we'll move swiftly on to the next question. Um, okay, another question, maybe a more serious question has come through now. And I think this is a very good question that's been asked. With regards to your slide, basically it says, I appreciate the Chinese market is rebounding. What figure would be new sales as compared to deals having been signed but not expected to close price? So I think he's basically meaning, so these deals that are now transferring after the lockdown, are these actually deals that were signed before the, the the lockdown occurred? And therefore, can it really be seen as a positive sign? The honest answer is, 
I'll need to do a little bit more research into what the average time from signing a transaction to when it actually transfers in uh, in China. But it's a good point, and I don't want to give a very firm answer on that. I think that the issue with trying to analyze data is you can sometimes get it wrong. So I'll try not to do that. But one thing will be very interesting is to follow that data very carefully and to see how things pan out in China over the next four or five, six weeks. Because if the deal cycle is similar to if the deal cycle is similar to Dubai, then and that graph continues for another four or five weeks, then we can be certain that it is genuinely uh, it's genuine activity that is returned to the market and it's not just activity that was there pre-crisis. Uh, so we'll keep uh, an eye on that. It's a very good question. Um, the next question that we've got here is, what's the expected depreciation in property sale rates in the next few months? Sorry, I moved there. Hang on. In the, in the coming months. Um, Gil, I will ask that question to you. What do you think is going to happen with the prices? Is it going to go down or is it going to continue? Uh, I mean, where, where is it going? Give everybody the answer. The crystal ball. <laughs> The, the crystal ball, exactly. I think the trend's still going to continue. Uh, the problem we had was an oversupply versus demand, and that started like six years ago, as you mentioned. Uh, obviously, this pandemic just froze everything at the moment, but we don't really know. At the moment, there's still a supply and demand problem, so we'll have to see where that pans out. But the seems to be very close to the bottom. At least it was before this pandemic. That was my opinion. So we'll just have to see what happens after. Yeah, my, my, my view on that, just to elaborate on that, when you ask, you know, where are the prices going to go in the coming months, really that's a very difficult question to answer and ultimately nobody knows the answer to that. My view in general though is that the market doesn't, it does in a, based on data, it does reach a bottom at one moment in time. If you take an accumulation of all of the transactions and then you work out where the bottom of the market is. In practice, how is that relevant for each individual buyer? The market is not one moment in time. It's not like a stock market. It's a period of time. And we may have already sold the cheapest five bed in the meadows. We sold a very cheap five bed in the meadows a while ago, and maybe no one's going to buy a cheaper one than that. So each different market, each different segment of the market, each different property type will reach its bottom at different time periods and that could be over a 12 month period so if you're a buyer rather than looking at this like a stock market like where's my entry point it'd be better to say is there a property out there that is the right property for me and can i get it at the right price and you might close that deal in the next three weeks that might never be surpassed by any other deal but then the market might not bottom out based on all the data for another 12 months so try and Look at this specific to you. What are you looking for? What opportunity are you trying to find? And the over the long term, if you buy a property now, anyone buying a property should buy one for a medium to long term. I'm confident that if anyone buys a property any time in the next six months, they'll probably look back five years from now and think it was a pretty good decision to do so. Um, but to try and choose from one month to the next, that's like trying to shoot the eyes off a fly. So that's pretty challenging. Um, Another question, let me just look through here, they're coming in, hang on. Um, the blue line of impressions you showed earlier, would that be as high or the highest you've seen in the last few years? I.e., is it a sign that before the coronavirus occurred, the market sentiment was that the market was at the bottom? So basically, I think they're saying, did the blue line show before the coronavirus that the market was starting to really feel that the bottom had already occurred? And if it wasn't for coronavirus, were we already um, going to see a rebound? Um, who wants to answer that question? Mark, do you want to have a, have a crack at that one? Yeah, sure. Thanks, John. Um, yeah, I mean, look, it's, again, it's always a guessing game. I mean, we're, all, we're, we're in a guessing game of something similar now with the uh, COVID-19, I'm sure a lot of people are looking at the, the graphs and the charts to see where it bottoms out and where the curve peaks and, and things like that. Um, you know, again, we're coming back to crystal ball kind of things here, but what we are seeing is that in the leasing market, we're seeing prices and, and value in the market as, as low as um, certainly I can remember. 
Um, there's multiple reasons for that. Obviously, there's a lot of stock now in the market compared to um, certainly, you know, when I fully moved to Dubai in 2007, the, the population was in the region of 1.6 million. We're now in the region of 3.2 million. So there's no question that um, there's a lot more out there. Um, and there's certainly the, the question mark over the, the supply that is coming into the market. Um, but I think what is positive in terms of um, what we're seeing in the market, you know, one of the things that um, happened just uh, a couple of weeks ago is that the, um, the central bank in, in Dubai have announced the 80% loan to value. Um, so that's had an increase, which has in, allowed um, buyers of properties, first time buyers to come in at, a, at, at certainly uh, either a lower cost or have a, have a bigger spending ability. Um, so whether it's whether it's bottomed out is is like I say it's al almost impossible to say. But I think that for me the feeling of the market was was of positivity. Um, although you know prices can still be falling whilst um, demand can be increasing, and obviously there has to be that crossover point where the two meet. And certainly we felt like the demand was heading in the right direction um, prior to this. And obviously that has um, you know has come into a stagnant period while we're here now. Um, you know, we are, we do have to evaluate that we're now coming very close to Ramadan um, and we're then coming into uh, into the summer period as well. But certainly I think with, uh, um, you know, with the positive sentiment that was around the expo, um, the expectation, I, I did a video probably six or eight weeks ago um, saying that I expected the loan to value to change um, somewhere around the expo now that i i believe this was going to happen anyway um and and that was for me really going to add fuel to what was a, a positive movement in the market um so yeah I, I do believe that things were starting to head in a in a positive direction okay thank you mark another question's come in here from mohammed um do you think Basically, it says, do you think now is the right time to purchase an off-plan property versus a ready unit, whether it be a villa or apartment? So I think the question is, I'll ask the question to you, Gil. Would you rather buy an off-plan property right now or a secondary market property? My view has always been I like the secondary market always because you, an off-plan property although you've got a good payment plan you don't really know what the community what the development is going to look like until it's completed and the whole area is completed so a secondary market let's say like emirates living you know where the parks are the lakes the family activities the amenities the supermarkets the nurseries everything's there so i always like to invest in something that you can physically see and, and use straight away and you can get some investment from it straight away that's my okay. personal yeah, good, good answer, Gil. Thank you for that. I think um, it's also important that I mention at this point that all of us on the panel, we all own properties in the UAE, so we all believe in the market. We've all, um, you know, Gil there, for example, mentioning that he prefers the the secondary market. Obviously, when your family wants to move in and live in a house, the secondary market's available right now. And Gil has done what I've done, which is to buy a property in the springs and then to completely renovate it so we've effectively got brand new properties in a community that we are fully certain about we know what it is we know where it is we know when we can live in it and we've made the changes to turn it into new property um, so that's what that's what secondary market stock will always deliver it will deliver certainty um, okay there's another question here. Please ask any questions. If you've got questions, please ask as tough as they might be. We're happy to give them an answer. We'll ask a few more questions and then I'll move to the closing statements. Um, I'll what, just say on that as well, John, the number of questions that are here. Sorry to interrupt you there. We have a, a crazy amount of questions here. So it's unlikely that we're going to get through them all. They're, they're absolutely flying in. So thank you, everyone, for the questions. And I think I'll suggest that we do some follow-up videos and some individual videos that will maybe post on, on LinkedIn and, and social media pages as well. Okay, great. Yeah, thanks for that. And thank you all for answer, asking all these questions. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll ask a, a few more, and then we'll move to the closing uh, statements. Um, what is the top rated freehold area to live in Dubai, in your opinion? Um, who would like to answer that? What's the top rated? What's your opinion, Mohammed? Where do you think the best place to live is freehold community? 
Well, it, yeah, um, it depends. Uh, it's a personal choice. Um, when you buy a house, the first thing is that you think from your heart. You go to community, you feel in love with it. And every person, now all the communities, most of the communities that are, that are that exist, they are good. They have, most of them has security, uh, mostly to be honest with you, Amar, most of them. Um, they have security, communal pools, parks, uh, all the service. Now, every person has to put the list. What would they prefer? One, two, three, four. What ticks the boxes? This is how you choose your home. For example, I know John and Gil, they live in the Springs. Uh, they like the community. It's a nice one. It needs a bit of renovation, which they did. They're happy with that. Personally, when I went to Mira, for example, I fell in love with the community. It was brand new, uh, MR, nice, pools, animities, everything was new. So personally, I would love to live in a new brand, a new community. Uh, some people would like to stay uh, in a better location, closer to Sheikh Zayed, for example. So there is, you have to put a list. What's your priority? Is it the location? Uh, closer to Sheikh Zayed, uh, is it the age of the community? But mainly, if you are looking for a community, uh, look at these points, I would say to all the people who are watching us. It should be gated community. It has the animities, pools, parks, um, well landscaped and uh, well serviced. So you go, you drive around and you have to feel in love with it. When you fall in love with it, then this is your home. Okay, thank you, That's Mohammed. Sure. Thank you, thank you for your answer. Um, okay, another question here. It, it appears that all businesses are making tough choices at the moment. What difficult decisions have you had to make in recent weeks? Um, I'll take this one because we have had to make some some difficult decisions, and like all businesses, big and small, we haven't escaped those really challenging decisions. Uh, unfortunately, we have had to look at cost-cutting measures. Um, there was three people that we employed that were part of our growth strategy, and those roles very quickly became redundant. So unfortunately, we've had to let them go. But we've made it clear to them that if this lockdown is over quickly and we get back on track, we would be, you know, they're welcome to to, to join again. Um, and that that's really difficult decisions to make. You know, that, that's the hardest thing of all of this lockdown is making those really difficult decisions. All of us on the screen here, all four of us have taken significant cuts to our own uh, to our own salaries. And that's actually, I would say, the, the easier decision over a three month period to take um, in the context of the pain that is obviously being endured by many other people in different businesses where they're losing their job. We've tried to keep redundancies to the absolute minimum. And um, people have therefore had to take salary cuts, but they're not as extreme as some of the salary cuts that I have heard in the market. So hopefully, um, hopefully we can get back on track quickly. The one thing that we have not cut, and actually I think this is very important for us and certainly probably for many other businesses, is that the lifeblood of the business, which is marketing, which is access to inquiries, access to, to buyers, sellers, tenants, landlords, We've kept that door as widely open as possible. And actually, we are increasing our spend. We're increasing our marketing budgets. Um, now, that's tough to do in this environment, but it's absolutely essential that we make sure the lifeblood of the business is there because that's what's going to keep us going. Um, and that, you know, there's lots of tough decisions, and no one knows if they're going to be exactly right or if they're going to be wrong. We've spent a lot of time trying to think very carefully to make sure we damage as many people as sorry as, as few people as possible. We do not want to damage people's lives in this challenging moment, but marketing has to go up, and that's what's that's what's happening. So you'll see a lot more exposure from Espace uh, as we move forward, and hopefully that will help us to maintain the livelihoods of everyone else that is is at Espace right now. Um, I'll ask one. One final question, which I think is an interesting one. Uh, this has actually come from a broker in the market. How are you keeping your staff motivated during these turbulent times? 
Um, Mark, if you answer that, this will be the last question, and then I'll move on to the closing statements. Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks, John. Um, so, how are we keeping the staff motivated? That's right. Yeah, how are we keeping the staff motivated during these turbulent times? Yeah, okay. Yeah, I mean, look, obviously, that's um, it, it's not easy when I, I think, you know, there are a lot of businesses that predominantly work from home and work remotely, certainly in the GCC, when we have, you know, people have construction staff in Saudi and things like that. Um, for us in real estate, uh, as a brokerage, that's certainly not a, a way that we've operated. And um, this has been a huge shift in in our day-to-day -day, um, roles, tasks, um, although the, the the detail in terms of, you know, what we do at the end of the day is, um, you know, sell and, and rent out properties for, for our clients and, and find homes for people, um, that part hasn't changed. But in terms of the detail of what we do each day, it's wildly different. So um, as an example, we have a... Um, a meeting um, with my team, which is which is just over the, the 20, 25 people. Um, every single day we have a meeting um, where we discuss what's happened in the market, whether it's good, whether it's bad. Um, and then we talk about the solutions that we have to those. Um, I think I'm in quite a fortunate position where I'm surrounded by quite a lot of people at home. Um, I've got my family and my and my uh, mother and father-in-law are here as well. So there's there's quite a lot of us in my in my house. Some of our brokers are actually sat on their own, um, and I can imagine that that is quite a um, a challenging place to be. So for me, it's about um, spending one-on-one -on -one time with the brokers um, that I can, but also making sure that every single day we spend time um, together. And I think what I do know from um, you know. It was my first real understanding of a, of a recession in the in the global crisis in 2008, and I was a real estate broker here. Something that I uh, believe very strongly is that um, when that happened um, in 2008, the company that I was working for was unfortunately one of the companies that didn't make it through. But what I do know is that um, the real estate market will bounce back. I do know that once we come out of the lockdown, um, we will be in a position to start doing transactions and I think they will start happening very quickly. So I think it's about focusing on the mid to long term goal rather than right here, right now. We know that very little is going to happen today, tomorrow or the day after, but we know whether it's a week from now or two weeks from now that the market will open back up and the time we've spent with our clients, understanding their challenges, their requirements, their needs, um, is is what's important. So that's kind of uh, a rough idea of what we're doing. Okay, thank you very much for that, Mark. Okay, if we could have the, the last slide, please, um, Said. I'm just going to finish on a positive note. I'm going to make a few. Uh, just this will take one minute. Um, give you a few a few closing statements. And while I'm doing that on the screen, you will see there are some properties that we've sold in uh, the last week or ten days during this lockdown. So it's um, it's important that we finish positively. Um, it, it's a good reminder to us all that despite the extremely challenging environment, um, the show must go on. And it, it honestly does. There are still transactions taking place. People will move forward with their life. I believe that personal circumstance will always be the single biggest ingredient in the decisions surrounding the residential property market. For some, it will be the right time to, to sell. And for some, it will be the right time to buy. So we're here to service that. Um, having cut my teeth in the UK commercial property market during the global financial crisis, I'm certainly not naive to the rocky road that may lie ahead. However, I am confident that on the back of a six-year decline in property value, there is genuinely underlying end-user demand that will see this moment as a great opportunity to enter the market with a medium to long-term lifestyle outlook in mind. And as you can see on the screen, that's exactly what's happened. The people that have been buying those properties are end users, and they're looking with a medium to long-term view in mind. So that's it. Hopefully we finish on a positive note. While we are realistic, we like to look positively at where this market will go. Thank you all very much for tuning in, and we look forward to doing this again. We will try and answer some of your questions in some other uh, media releases that we do over the coming weeks. Have a good afternoon, everyone. Stay safe and stay well. Cheers.